Welcome to the uh, second program of March, uh, the 31st year of the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II History Roundtable, and a program appropriately on Women's History Month. I, I'd, I'd like to recognize if, if the World War II veterans in the audience would stand. World War II veterans. Thank you. This evening, uh, uh, Connie Harris, Dr. Connie Harris, who was a student of Harold Deutsch and carries on the legacy. She's actually uh, doing a monograph, is that the correct, o on Harold and, uh, and uh, a great member of our group. She does the round tablet, by the way, so uh, give her a great hand, Connie. Our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Ann Todd. She received her bachelor's and master's from Texas A&M, the same place that Don went to school, and she received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, but as she likes to say, she does bleed maroon and white, which if you don't know, that's the Aggie colors. Um, she has been a contributing author and consultant for the National Geographic Society and has given presentations at national parks about OSS operations. She has worked as a historian for the National Marine Museum of the Marine Corps, so our Marine fellows here, and she's connected to you folks. And she's gonna be speaking tonight about Betty McIntosh, uh, a member of the OSS, um, and she became friends with Betty um, during the last five years of Betty's life and was provided with extensive interviews. And she probably will talk more about how she came to meet Betty. Um, everyone, and Todd. The Office of Strategic Services. OSS is often referred to as the precursor or the predecessor to the CIA, and it was. But it was much more than that. It also gave birth to special forces, national security agency, and all forms of uh, psychological warfare that this country practices today. OSS was a unique experiment. It brought together people from all walks of life to fight World War II with covert and clandestine operations. It was also a quirky fly-by-night outfit that made things up as it went along. Its detractors called OSS people oh-so-social, spies with ties, the inmates running the asylum. My favorite is a PhD that could win a bar fight. <laughs> I do have a short list of the kind of characters that were attracted to OSS. In addition to members of every nationality and ethnicity, we had movie stars, film producers, artists, journalists, priests, dog trainers, safe crackers, usually sprung from prison, <laughs> members of the canine corps, bird watchers, carrier pigeons, and one elephant was on the rolls of OSS by the end of the war. When Pearl Harbor was attacked December 7, 1941, this country had no organized, centralized intelligence organization. We had, uh, the military was not practicing commando style warfare, although it would soon. And no one, and I mean no one, was practicing psychological warfare because it was considered to be the most distasteful of activities. Thanks to one man, William J. Donovan, Medal of Honor winner from the First World War, Wall Street uh, lawyer, adventurer. Just such an organization, the ground had been laid for just such an organization. Donovan was not without his detractors, not least of which was a sizable contingent of the United States government, including but not limited to uh, the FBI, the State Department, and almost the entire military command structure. But Donovan had two very important people in his corner. Franklin Delano Roosevelt loved all things covert and cloak and dagger. And Winston Churchill 
wanted to set Europe ablaze with the same kind of psychological warfare the Nazis had been dishing for years. Subject of my book, Operation Blackmail, is Elizabeth P. McIntosh, who was born in 1915 and lived to be 100 years old. She was a reporter, served in OSS. Uh, she worked in the State Department, Voice of America, a long career in the CIA. She wrote two children's books and one nonfiction book about women in the OSS, which is how I found her. I knew Betty the last five years of her life. She often told me that the 18 months she spent in OSS were the very best times of her life, and I wanted to know why. Because I believed if I answered that question, I would understand more about this legendary organization. Admiral William McRaven, one of my personal heroes, once said that there was just something mythical about OSS. Betty was the daughter of two newspaper reporters, and she grew up in Hawaii. Um, she was in high school what I would call a popular loner. She was captain of the tennis team. She wrote for the paper and the yearbook. Uh, her teachers remembered her as being incredibly bright and completely uh, mischievous. But at the end of every day, she walked home alone and she went to spend time with her very best friend, Daisy the Elephant, at the zoo. After graduating from the University of Washington with a degree in journalism, her father hired her to work with him on the Honolulu Advertiser. She uh, was put on the sports desk. He loved sports. She loathed the sports desk and contrived to get herself thrown off it by deliberately misspelling the name of Hawaii's native son, the famous swimmer, Duke Kahanamoko. <laughs> One good thing to come from the sports desk was meeting her future husband, Alexander McDonald. He was working the police beat. Betty and Alex were drawn together by a mutual love of all things Japanese. They married in 1940, and while their house was being built by a young, little-known architect named Philip Johnson, they lived with uh, Professor Watanabe and his wife so that they could immerse themselves in traditional Japanese uh, living and become fluent in the language. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, Betty was making breakfast in their new house. Alex put on his uniform. Uh, he was a Lieutenant JG in the Navy, Naval Reserve. She didn't see him for two weeks. Everyone's life changed that day. For Betty, she went from being a reporter at a local newspaper to a war correspondent. She was picked up as a stringer by Scripps Howard News Service and she served under Admiral Nimitz command. She worked very hard. She wrote some excellent copy in the, in the weeks and months to come, but the Army had slapped a lid of censorship down on the entire Hawaiian archipelago, and they weren't letting anything out. She tried everything. She wrote articles and sent them to the mainland to her friends to try and get published that way, so they received pieces of paper that looked like this. She hitched a ride on a sampan to go deliver medicine to the lepers on Molokai. She hiked an erupting volcano and wrote about that. Apparently the army felt that if the Japanese read about the volcano, they would be able to get line of sight and make another bombing run. As though the Japanese didn't know where Hawaii was by that time. <laughs> Then, to make matters much, much worse, it came to light that Alex was one of the censors working for naval intelligence. And the mother of all marital squabbles erupted. Scripps Howard offered to send Betty to Washington, D.C. to cover the Eleanor Roosevelt White House, and she would be writing about women's issues, specifically rationing. She threw herself into that with gusto. 
But after a few months of writing about how much copper could be saved by melting down hooks and eyes, or nickel silver from sunglasses, she grew, once again, frustrated. Just then, she was approached by an OSS recruiter, seemingly out of the mist, which is what they did. They just appeared. He said to her, would you like to work for the government? We understand you speak Japanese. You will be doing something very secret, possibly dangerous, and we'll probably send you to Asia. Betty reported to OSS headquarters on Navy Hill just as soon as they would let her in the gate. While being fingerprinted the first day, she met her friend and partner in crime, fellow recruit, Jane Foster. Jane was an artist of international repute. She uh, was known for her caricatures and collages. She had been poached from the Board of Economic Warfare by Donovan for her fluency in Malay, which was the lingua franca of um, what was, came to be known as Indonesia. Um, <clears throat> she acquired her language skills and familiarity uh, while enduring an unhappy marriage to a Dutch colonial official in Batavia which is now Jakarta. This is one of her sketches. This is her personal servant. His name was Dog. She tried everything to call him something else, but he liked his name. Betty and Jane were recruited into a new branch of OSS, Morale Operations, where they would learn to use whatever means necessary to confuse, deceive, and demoralize the enemy in this case, the Japanese. As I mentioned, psychological warfare was not a popular weapon in the United States arsenal, but the British made it very clear that it had to be an essential part of Allied strategy. One man volunteered to take it on. No one knew how to train people to be psychological warriors, so Donovan decided to pull together creative types artists, journalists, people familiar with the various regions of the world where um, the populations would be targeted. And of course, once again, this attracted some characters. So the East Asia contingent of morale operations, in addition to Betty and Jane, included a Chinese artist, a Shanghai businessman, a private detective, producer of the Lucky Strike Hit Parade, an Olympic broad jump champion, a patent medicine salesman, and missionaries, lots of missionaries. My personal favorite being the elderly Miss Lucy Starling, who demanded to be allowed to jump in to northern Thailand to set up an, an MO base. She could field strip a machine gun blindfolded in seconds. This is a typical proposal for a black propaganda project. Let me back up a second. Black propaganda was the tool of morale operations. Now the point of black propaganda is point of origin. Um, you fake a newspaper and make it look like it's being, it was printed in Honshu province in Japan. <coughs> you uh, broadcast a radio program and uh, pretend that it's Radio Tokyo when really it's being transmitted from a hand crank generator in Chittagong. So this is a poem in a faked magazine that's posing as a publication from Tokyo. It's an inducement to surrender that's been put to verse. These matchboxes, this is another proposal, which was to create matchboxes and uh, put messages in them. The Japanese, then as now, valued everything aesthetic in their everyday life. The most ordinary things had to be beautiful. This is a carefully replicated example of a Japanese matchbox. Now, they had to use exactly the right paper, the right inks, and even the little matchsticks had to be whittled by hand exactly the way they were in Japan. The Japanese were smart people and they could spot a fake a mile away. So inside, uh, here's the cover, 
and inside is the uh, message. <laughs> so projects started uh, piling up these kind of proposals, uh, piling up in a filing cabinet. And the morale operations group became very uh, frustrated because they wanted to go to the China-Burma-India theater, which is what you see here. You see the picture of Burma. Um, In 1944, in July, they finally got their orders. Most people then as now didn't even know this theater existed, let alone that there were Americans there. So let me give you a little backstory. When the Japanese invaded in 1942, let me see if I can work this, they rode collapsible bicycles up the Malay Peninsula, took Rangoon, and then Mutaguchi's 15th Army split, and uh, General uh, Watanabe went up here to take the air base at Michina. Lieutenant General Sato headed through the mountains and the jungles to go up into India, where he would invade, occupy, and go across India to hook up with the Germans. But a funny thing happened when Sato got to the Kohima Imphal Railhead. The Indian Army, with their British uh, overlords, defeated them and turned them back. Sato messaged Mutaguchi and said, Our swords are broken, we're going home. So they headed back down all the way across Burma. Now, when they were going north, they were on the offensive. Their supply lines were strong. They were motivated. They were winning. When they turned around, they were defeated. They were down to one rice ball a day. The, topo the topography of this part of Burma, it goes like this. And uh, it's like someone just squished the country. So in the morning, you could be on uh, the jungle floor, you know, ab above 100 degrees. And then at night, when you pitch your tent, you could be above the timberline, freezing. They were going single file through the jungle and up the mountains. On either side, the jungle was thick, almost dark. So they were sick. They had dysentery. That had, they had that horrible kind of cerebral malaria that will kill you in two hours. There were snakes, deadly snakes, called the crate. If they bit you on the ankle, they called them two-step crates because you might make it two steps before you drop. And on either side of them, they could see in the jungle, keeping pace with them, giant striped tigers that were getting fatter and fatter <laughs> as they picked these poor soldiers off the trail. <coughs> these tigers, normally, they had to take down a water buffalo. So these Japanese soldiers were like Chicken McNuggets to them. <laughs> Even the old tigers, the ones with bad teeth, were flourishing, OK? So they're sick. They're terrified by these tigers. And they would go through villages, and the Burmese would gleefully tell them all about the weir tiger, which is half human, half tiger, nocturnal, and of course, impervious to bullets, couldn't be killed. So, I mean, these soldiers are delirious. They're weakened and sick. Meanwhile, OSS Detachment 101 was in northern Burma teaching the mountain people how to kill Japanese more effectively. These are the Kachin mountain people. The Kachin had a robust warrior culture, but they were basically using um, muskets and spears and clubs. So the DET 101 guys equipped them with M1 Garands and Springfields and grenades and turned them into a deadly killing force. These gentlemen are Naga headhunters. The OSS had high hopes for the Naga because they had a fierce reputation for being headhunters. But when they met them, they found them to be jolly gentle folk who really didn't want to kill anything. And they couldn't light a fire under them. So they gave up. One day, the Americans were having uh, their midday meal. 
and a group of the Naga that they had been trying to train jogged up and dumped a gunny sack full of Japanese heads on the lunch table. The Americans lost their lunch and thereafter left the Naga to their own tactics and strategies. They were very, very effective at terrorizing and killing Japanese. So when the morale operations contingent went to China, Burma, India, it split. Betty and her crew went to New Delhi and uh, the rest, Jane, Paul Child, the future Julia Child, and others went to Ceylon. This is uh, Detachment 404 in Ceylon. And you can see Donovan there in the center and the tall guy next to him was Colonel Coughlin. He was the CO of the outfit. Uh, in Detachment 404, I'm sure you recognize um, Julia McWilliams, later to be the famous celebrity chef. This is Paul Child, who she eventually married. Judo expert, lumberjack, uh, artist. Paul created uh, topographical three-dimensional maps for the commanders in the theater that needed them. <coughs> this is Dylan Ripley. Dylan was a brand new PhD and he was an ornithologist. He loved his birds and he eventually became um, the head of the Smithsonian Institution for many years. But at this point, like I said, he's a brand new PhD and um, Dylan, if he heard the song of the triple-breasted thrush, he was off into the jungle. He would just wander off and they would have to go find him and bring him back. When he wasn't doing that, he was running secret operations down into Thailand. This dangerous crew is Betty and some of her workers. There's Betty. Uh, this is Marge Severins, who also came with her. A couple of British guys. This is Bill Magistretti, a fellow Japanese linguist. This is Angel Puss. Betty adopted a dog everywhere she went. And uh, this grumpy looking guy is the dog walla. When you went to India, the British insisted you had to have your wallas. You had your tea walla, your laundry walla, and you actually had your dog walla, which, which was the lowest of the low. Probably why he doesn't look too happy. When they got to theater, um, to, as I mentioned, to do black propaganda, you have to have the right materials. You have to have a regular press, an offset press, the right rice paper, the right vegetable uh, dye, kanji script. Um, she had none of these things. None of it made it there. She had one box of typewriter ribbon and no typewriter. The British had everything she needed. The British didn't like the Americans. They felt quite rightly, that the Americans wanted to take away their colonial possessions and give them back to the uh, occupied peoples. But Betty made friends. She played lots of games of tennis, drank lots of gin, and um, they let her one day come and dip her hand into a wet mailbag that had been captured. And they said, whatever you can grab and pull out, you can use. She pulled out <clears throat> a stack of postcards that Japanese soldiers had written to go home to their families. And so this is an example of a black postcard. See, the, the kanji script is written in pencil, so they erased it and they replaced uh, the message that these soldiers were trying to send home with their own. So Betty, for example, took a black postcard, a young soldier writing his wife, very loving message. She erased it and uh, she put this. <clears throat> Dear Keiko, the situation here has become unbearable. The war is lost. Do not believe what the government is telling you. I myself have fallen in love with a Kachin maiden <laughs> and have been welcomed into her village where I will remain when my unit moves on. Please go on without me your loving husband, Yoki. <laughs> I know, wicked, right? They felt so good about this project that Betty started um, 
paying uh, Burmese assassins with you know, slices off a brick of opium to go kill these couriers and bring her the mailbags. So for an example of correspondence going the other way, uh, this is a young wife writing to her poor husband in Burma. Uh, would be, she described the necessity of sleeping with corrupt local, local officials um, for extra rations because the children had already notched up their belt three times. But don't worry about us. We're fine. Keep fighting the war. Here's a close-up of the postcard. This is a faked, um, these are faked pictures of supposed Japanese civilians that have been killed in a bombing of Japan, which hadn't happened. This is a threat letter. The Burmese headmen, when the Japanese were going up, the headmen in every village had to decide, are we going to collaborate or are we going to resist? And when the Japanese were winning, they collaborated. So when they were retreating, not so much. But Betty and her crew had to convince these headmen to stop collaborating. So she came up with the idea of sending a letter to the headman saying, basically, this one says, Dear Headman, um, this is your fellow headman, and this is his blood when we found out that he was helping the Japanese. You're next. She would write that. Um, they would prick their fingers, you know, get it bloody, put them on the floor, walk on them for a few days, and then slip them back into, you know, pay the Burmese little guy to go and distribute them in the uh, villages. One of the most successful ones was a surrender order, fake surrender order, JB1. Um, she, again, paid uh, an assassin to kill a, a document courier. He was carrying orders. Uh, and she faked a surrender order. She got the help of a Japanese POW, uh, Mr. Akamoto, and uh, they did it just right. It had to be an official language, so he helped her with that. He was a, a college-educated man. Uh, and again, they had to get the right ink, they had to do the right seal, everything. And uh, so they sent these things out, and at the end of the war, before the end of the war, the Japanese were walking out of the jungle with these things in their hands. So it's a rare example of knowing what you've done works because morale operations, it's opaque on both ends. You think you know what your target is, you're not quite sure, and you never know if it's had its intended result or if it even got where you're sending it. So it wasn't for people who needed instant gratification. These boys are the Kimpi Thai. The Kimpi Thai were basically the counterparts to morale operations. Um, they trained for years. They learned the languages of the various cultures where the Japanese had occupied. They were the thought police. And uh, they raided people's houses, took their diaries and read them. They were just as bad as you could possibly think. But, you know, so Betty was up against guys that had been trained and schooled and had all the provisions that she didn't have. This is the Burma Road. It was the lifeline that ran from Lido, the Lido railhead in Burma, to Kunming, China. When the Japanese invaded in 42, they cut that lifeline. It's also an exact replica of my driveway in Texas. <laughs> so Betty had to fly the hump when she received orders to go to Kunming. The hump, uh, was a 481 mile gauntlet through mountain peaks that were like needle-like peaks in these airplanes that half of them didn't hold pressure. Uh, she was terrified, and rightly so. She took a C-47 from Dum Dum Air Airport to fly over the su southern Himalayas, as you can see here, to Kunming. She had a reason to be terrified. This is a C-47 that ditched with all hands killed. She sewed this inside her flight jacket. It's what they call a blood chit. 
I'm sure all you pilots know about this. It basically says, if you find this American, help them. They're our friends. This is Kunming, China. Kunming was 7,000 feet up on a plateau. This was behind enemy lines because at the base of that plateau were Japanese. So there Betty was, behind enemy lines, to uh, you do, her, do her thing, write her black propaganda. It was also the base of uh, Claire Chenault and his flying tigers. There he is. Colonel Hepner, Dick Hepner was the CO of Detachment 202, which was the OSS detachment in China. This is Betty in China with her new dog. Uh, this is Sammy. Sammy uh, came across the Burma Road before it closed, and the GI driver shared his gin ration with Sammy, who then developed a taste for gin. And uh, to, the, to the end of his life, when Betty had her martini in the evening, he took his in a saucer. <laughs> and here she is with her helpers. Things in China were different. Whereas in India, she was making things up. She was scheming and trying to get inside the head of the Japanese. In China, it was a regular publication outfit where they had uh, faked magazines and newspapers that went out on a regular schedule. And so here she is working with one of her helpers there. This is a typical black poem that would be in one of those magazines. And here she is with uh, Kunming flooded that year. So this is, uh, by this time, it's the summer of 1945. And um, right after this picture, the friend on her left picked her up and threw her in the water because she had, when he got uh, promoted, she sewed his sergeant stripes on upside down. <laughs> now, the British, as you may know, Stop the war every day for tea. OSS sent out these invitations at least once a week. They would uh, get dressed in their best finery. They would uh, cook up some bathtub gin and they would have a party. They'd have a dance. Here she is years later. Uh, OSS was disbanded October 1st, 1945. Uh, Donovan received a letter of appreciation from President Truman. No uh, personal visit to the White House, no handshake, no nothing. Uh, Betty ended up, after working at the State Department and the Voice of America, having a wonderful career in the CIA, where she was sent by Alan Dulles back to Asia, and she, was an, uh, she ran agent, an agent network in Japan for years. Here she is in Arlington Cemetery in front of, uh, behind William Donovan's grave. Behind her would be two of her three husbands, uh, Bill Magistretti, Claire Chenault. They're all there. Here she is at age 98. If only I could look so good. Here she is hiding behind an OSS flag when she was 99. We lost her in uh, June of 2015. Um, for her 100th birthday, the CIA brought her into Langley, gave her a party in the executive dining room. Uh, Director Brennan actually cut her steak for her. And uh, it was really cool. The Special Forces guys lined up to flirt with her. and. Uh, <laughs> Y'all, she had boyfriends right up until the day she died. <laughs> they were hovering, you know? She had, in her little house, she had her husband's pictures, all three of them, on her, you know, three happy marriages, she liked to say. I want you to explain the, uh, the Mukden raid that was part of this detachment? Well, the OSS had been tasked with uh, finding out everything they could about where the prisoners of war were being held in Asia. 
and they had done that quite well. And so uh, right after the Japanese surrender, and most of the Japanese out there didn't know the surrender had happened, uh, Colonel Hepner, who you saw, Betty CO and her second husband, was um, ordered to go get them, go get the POWs. And so he formed the Mercy Missions, and they all had bird names. There was Eagle, Magpie, and uh, Cardinal. Team Cardinal went to Mukden. Mukden was where uh, General Wainwright was being held. He was actually being held 100 miles north in Xi'an. But, you know, they had to work all that out. They landed, the Japanese were hostile. They had to be convinced that the war had ended. This happened everywhere they went. Uh, the Russians got involved, but they finally got uh, General Wainwright out. And, and the uh, reason that was important is MacArthur <coughs> wanted Wainwright <coughs> on the Missouri at the surrender ceremony. So that's a, that's a key part of uh, this uh, attachment to it. I have to know about the elephant. How did they get the elephant? Daisy or the one on the rolls of the OSS? Well, it's Burma. They needed those elephants. You know, and so they, you know, the OSS took care of their people, even if they were elephants. I understand uh, some uh, U.S. commanders were hostile to the OSS, I think uh, especially <laughs> Douglas MacArthur. Uh, why was that? Well, they couldn't stand Donovan. They couldn't stand him. Douglas MacArthur was jealous because Donovan had the Medal of Honor and he didn't. Donovan made a point whenever he was going to be around Douglas MacArthur, he didn't wear any of these other ribbons, only the Medal of Honor. <laughs> so there was no, law of, no love lost between those two. Um, so he wouldn't let him in his theater. Admiral Nimitz wasn't too keen on him either, but Nimitz decided he needed underwater swimmers to, uh, the underwater demolition swimmers that Donovan had, and so Donovan was able to get some of his Marine unit people into Nimitz's theater. Yeah, uh, why was the OSS uh, disbanded and what were some of Betty's duties at the CIA uh, later in her career? Well, it was disbanded because Truman joined the gang of people who didn't like Donovan. Donovan had lots of enemies, lots. J. Edgar Hoover hounded his people for years. Um, Betty, in the CIA, she went to Japan and uh, she was involved, let me think of how much I can say here, kind of doing the same work. I can tell you that they put her on an island of her own and gave her a boat so that she could court uh, other writers. They sent her as a children's author, that was her cover which, as you know, the best cover is one that has a lot of truth to it. Uh, Dulles had one of her books translated into Japanese. And so she was there to infiltrate the writers' groups and identify the communists and whatnot. She did a lot of other stuff, but she wouldn't tell me. And uh, the stuff she did tell me, I don't think I'm supposed to share. <laughs> yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, the other, a lot of other women serving the OSS. Do you have any... Uh, information or what about Virginia Hall who is in Europe mm -hmm. doing a lot of the same types of thing, running oh, operations. Well. Virginia Hall, I mean, she was the real deal. Um, Virginia Hall uh, was fluent in French and several other languages. She had a wooden leg named Cuthbert. <laughs> she was also one who demanded to be able to parachute in and, and help the Maquis behind French lines. They wouldn't let her parachute in. She went in, at, at first for the British, and she was so effective at arming the Maquis and other resistance groups that the Nazis put a bounty on her head. And she was actually captured once. She got away. She got out. And she said, okay, I want to go back. And the British said, are you crazy? They know who you are. She goes, I'll go in disguise. No. She asked Donovan. Donovan said, okay, sounds like a good idea. So she went right back in. She ended up training thousands of irregular partisan type forces. True hero. Is there another book there for you? Oh, everybody loves Virginia Hall. 
know. Where did she learn to read and write Japanese? Betty? Yes. Uh, well, she lived with this uh, Japanese professor and his wife and studied. Did her uh, major contribution come in Burma with those de demoralized retreating Japanese or in China? Oh, well, I don't know how she would answer that. Um, it was two totally different operations. In Burma, she was uh, fighting blind. She was just coming up with stuff that she hoped would upset them. And as, you know, I, I read these postcards, I think they would upset people. Um, but she never knew. When she got to China, it was a totally different operation where it was already up and running. I forgot to mention, the last week of July, 1945, she stopped for coffee in the Black Radio Shack in Kunming. And the scriptwriter there was stomping up and down, uh, Cy Nadler. He was in a total swivet because he said, I just can't come up with something that's really going to upset the Japanese on the home islands. So he was just blocked. So Betty says, well, how about you say the first week of August there's going to be a great catastrophe? <laughs> Something from the sky. You know, with fire. He goes, basically, no, that's so lame. <laughs> so she left, yeah, whatever. He decided, okay, I can't come up with anything better. So he ran that, okay, broadcasted that. Betty flew off to Chunking to visit some OSS uh, buddies. She flew back on August 6th, walked in the radio room, and found out that her great catastrophe had happened. And her CO was looking for her. <laughs> Did she have any contact with um, General Stilwell over uh, in the Far East? And then secondly, uh, did, did she ever have any children? Um, the answer to the first question is no. And I, th I believe he was fired before she got to the theater. Um, but I will tell you this as a little plug for my book. There's a lot of walk-ons, okay? We got Ho Chi Minh. We got just about everybody but Stillwell. Um, what was the second question? Did she have children? Did she oh, have children? no. She was unable to do that. But she loved them dearly. Um, she had multiple animals her whole life. And on her Leesburg estate, every Easter, she had an egg hunt for every child in the tri-state area. So she was a lot of fun, but she wasn't able to have children. As Betty was familiar with the Japanese language, did she ever, uh, was she ever required to be a code breaker like the Freedmans? No, she was not. Um, they really didn't do much cryptanalysis or code breaking there um, in that theater, and morale operations sh uh, certainly didn't do any. Um, but I will, once again, go off on a little tangent and, and point out that Betty was known as a jab lover, and it was uh, an epithet. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, all the uh, military, they believed that Japanese were not smart enough or even human enough to be susceptible to um, black propaganda. But she was so effective because she did love the Japanese and she knew that inside every soldier there was a homesick boy that missed his mother, missed his koi pond, and she, it informed her work. That didn't have anything to do with your question, but I just forgot about it and wanted to mention it. You knew her towards the end of her life. Did she talk to you about sort of what she saw as the future? What things about sort of present day history and politics were most concerning to her now? Well, one night, <clears throat> She asked me about Facebook. She said, what is this Facebook? You know, I, I didn't do Facebook at the time, but I knew basically what it was, so I kind of sketched it out for her. And then uh, I went to the kitchen to get us a glass of wine. I came back, and on an envelope, she had completely mapped out a strategy for weaponizing Facebook. <laughs> and she wanted Putin. She wanted him. And this was, 
you know, 2014, seven years ago. <laughs> but she's like, we got to do something about him. <laughs> so she had a whole plan for, oh, it was funny stuff, you know, to put on Facebook fake news, you know, that would get under people's skin about Vlad. <laughs> so she was, she was already tuned in to what was coming. I think. The OSS in Argentina, was that mostly fiction or is it had basis in fact? Oh, W.E.B. Griffin. I read them all. Eh, I believe there was. Um, Donovan, you know, South America was supposed to be the FBI's bailiwick. Donovan never missed an opportunity to try and intrude on J. Edgar Hoover's uh, turf. So I do believe there was some operations down there. I even think they did involve the Constellation, uh, Howard Hughes's airplane. But I'm not sure about that. I'm a fan of his fiction, for sure. When she was uh, producing these fake postcards and, and letters and things, did she have a duplicating device of some kind, or did she do all these by hand? Uh, they did some wood blocks, but no. Um, for certain things, they had to have a regular press that doesn't um, that that actually makes an indentation, and so they had to, you know, they begged the use of the British press to. Uh, it's like a mimeograph machine. They also had to have an offset press for other things because the Japanese would know immediately if you didn't use the right press. So it was, it was you know, they were using presses when they weren't just, you know, by hand changing things with an eraser. It sounds like Betty had a great deal of autonomy when she was in theater. Can you speak a little bit to maybe the contrast when she came back uh, stateside post-war and maybe lack of autonomy, more of a structured environment, or especially since it's Women's History Month? Yeah. Uh, first thing she noticed when she got back was there were no wallas. <laughs> What's that about? No one was making her tea. No one was bringing her hot water in the morning or, you know, diving for her luggage. Um, when she was in theater, and this was true of everybody in the OSS, um, you know, Washington had definite ideas about how things were to be run in morale operations. And you were supposed to submit proposals and get permission and follow their guidelines. Well, they didn't do any of it. They just quit asking. And, you know, th back then, uh, word didn't get immediately to where it was supposed to go. So they just, she said, we did what we wanted it to do. And so when she got home, you know, I think the early days of the CIA uh, still retained a little bit of that uh, OSS out of the box kind of irregularity from what I could gather. So she didn't have too much of a reentry problem. I was going to say, did you want to speak about Eleni, anything about Jane Foster, who was Betty's best friend and the cartoonist and such? Um, I think that you mentioned that as your next work. Well, for? I think so. Uh, my dissertation was actually entitled Betty and Jane because Betty wanted me to write about her best friend in addition to herself. I had to move Jane to the background for the book. Um, you know, whereas Betty went on to a long service in the CIA, uh, Jane Foster was indicted on 38 counts of espionage for spying for the NKVD. She uh, took refuge in Paris, so they were at, never ever able to take it to trial. There's people on both sides, you know, defending her. Betty swore until the day she died that Betty was, that uh, Jane was not guilty. So, um, yeah, I, I need to write about Jane, I think. Well, if there's not any more questions, let's thank her. Oh, Don had some. Uh, one of the things that uh, I mentioned Bob Maynard, uh, Bob uh, and this program kind of came together. Again, I'm always trying to match historians mm -hmm. with veterans, and Bob had been on our program several times. But uh, he, um, when uh, Naval Institute contacted me, uh, get, actually sent me an advance copy of, of your book, I says, Detachment 202, okay. Bob Maynard 202, uh, what, a, what a great 
historian and participant uh, this will be. Uh, unfortunately, Bob died about two weeks after that decision was made. And, and the reason I say that, several of you came up this evening uh, when we put out the original program for last year. It was going to be on Nazi architecture. Uh, I, uh, in May, we'll, we'll hopefully get out of a, a list of programs for next year. We're about 90% there right now. But uh, this has been such a delight to have you up, and I wish we could have had uh, uh, Bob and, and uh, Helen here tonight. Well, what he's not mentioning uh, is that Bob Maynard was very close to Dick Hepner, so I know Betty had to have known him intimately. And so it's a, just a double shame that, uh, you know, things couldn't happen sooner. He was one of those guys I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. If you want to see what, who Don is speaking of, if you go to our, uh, the website and our YouTube episodes uh, on, with Doug Waller when he wrote the book uh, Wild Bill Donovan and the book Disciples, I believe those were the two ep um, shows where we had uh, Bob Maynard speaking and you can hear um, his stories of his time in the OSS in China. So check out our YouTube um, stations and our YouTube episodes. So once again, uh, we'll see you again in a few weeks on April 12th and another round of applause for Ann. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn dash www.roundtable.org Production services provided by Barrows Productions.